Welcome everyone, we're now recording and I'm glad you could join us and David Reck to talk about Scribe and what you can do as Open Textbook Network Publishing Cooperative members. So David, um, if you would please start with just an introduction, a little bit about yourself and your story. So a quick introduction, those of, I assume you're all familiar with the Wellform Document Workflow. No, no, I, no. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> we're starting way at the beginning, so, so we'll do that in a minute. You don't have enough time to start way in the beginning because I was 12 when I started Scribe. But uh, so Scribe is an editorial production and workflow services company. We started out as a research center at the University of Pennsylvania and then started offering first electronic development services in 1995. And then we worked our way up through the production and then to the editorial world in 2001. And since 2001, we've been offering a full complement of editorial and production services, primarily to academic, university, educational, reference, and religious publishers. Because of our early foray into electronic, that was a kind of natural world. Subsequently, of course, ebooks are ubiquitous, and so we're doing much more than just that area. That's the short version of our story. Thank you. So, um, does that mean that Scribe is a publisher, David? Yes, no, we're not a publisher. So, what we do is we offer everything from ad hoc services to what we call back office support for publishers. And so we are available to our clients on a kind of work as needed, work best practices, work to their you know, requirements and their setup kind of situation. So we are often employed to do things as simple as data conversion to prep a manuscript so that it can go through the editorial and pro production process all the way through to, as I mentioned, back office. We handle the publishing programs for a few of our publishing clients and that means everything from developmental editing, review editing, review process, permissions, all the way through to making sure that everything is printed correctly and in the warehouse and available for distribution correctly. And can you name a few of the publishers that you work with just so we can have a sense of your reach? Yeah, so the Predominantly, we're working for university presses. So we work for the University of Minnesota Press. We work for Michigan University of Michigan Press. We work for uh, Princeton University Press. They, they use our workflow. In addition to that, we're, again, we're very prominent in the academic and reference publishing world. So we do a number of publications for HarperCollins predominantly in their Christian division because they have what's called CAR, which is an academic side of things, as well as their Bible publications. We do quite a number of them. Uh, the Random House, now Penguin Random House, uses our a version of our well-formed document workflow to produce their books. And they, um, what's the word, trust us, I guess, to produce about 500 of their books every year. So it runs the gamut. But uh, predominantly, our focus is to university presses and more and more university library publishing entities. And our real strength is in the more complex publications like textbooks. And <clears throat> you uh, have previously shared some sort of historical background about publishing, which people were really interested in hearing. Can you share just a little bit about um, where we've been and where we are right now in the publishing landscape from your viewpoint? So based on the question, I, I think you're referring to our concept of mission-driven publishing or our, the mission-driven publishing? Yes. Okay, so in the past, it, this word curating is now becoming a popular word. We've been using this for a while and so in the past, publishers were essentially curators between the, curating the relationship through publications between authors and their audiences. And since the 1950s, publishing has become a bit anachronistic in the sense that it 
has relied more on what we refer to as anonymous transactions. You know, someone buys a book, not from the publisher, but they buy a book from a bookstore. That book acquires from the publisher. And, you know, the logical result of that is what's been going on with Amazon, where they just publish books themselves or make books available, and they've completely commoditized everything. And the resulting component of that in the editorial production world of things is that publishers have also engaged in that kind of commodity type of activity in that, you know, we hire freelancers at cut rate to do work and we separate them out from the production people who are hired in a particular way. All of those people are removed from the audience and from the author to some extent, even if they're involved with the author. And so what we've been trying to do is point out the utility of that and the unsustainability of that model. And the OTM as an example is trying to solve a problem that is the result of that, which is the commoditization of publishing has led to a huge problem that we're seeing now in the commercial textbook market, has led to a whole host of issues that in the quality of the publication, the cost of the publication, the remuneration to the authors, the way that it's distributed, the way they speak to their audience, et cetera, et cetera. And so what we're suggesting is that there's a better way to do that. And by offering technology, what we try to do is focus more on the editorial process and that relationship between the author and the audience that she's trying to reach. Does that make sense? And so our services are really focused for that. Whether it be the way we copy edit or the design, we're trying to meet the needs of those audiences. Uh, just a little side note, I had a conversation yesterday with someone from Oregon who's in Eugene, and we were talking about something, and I, there's a classic book, I can't tell you the name of it because I actually plagiarized it. There's a classic book in, sociology in the field of sociology and religious studies that a lot of people read and I went through that book and I edited it to modern rhetorical methodology and I happen to have two classes that were test cases and this of course is not scientific but what happened was is I had the published version read by one class and the re-edited version read by the second class and to a person, the second class people really liked the book and got the argument and were excited about it and wanted to learn more about it. And the people in the original published version of that book found it to be boring and repetitive and not worth reading and had a difficult time gleaning the argument. And, you know, that sounds like a small thing, but if we're attentive to the rhetoric and the methodology and the way that students understand things when they're writing textbooks and we're also attentive to the science of comprehension when we craft our publications we should be in a position to do that better and reach them in a much more effective pedagogical manner that's all i have to say i could rant on about that forever though <laughs> Well, uh, thank you for, as Jonathan pointed out, not a double-blind experiment, but a nice anecdotal uh, test. Yes, strictly anecdotal, but, you know, of course it confirms your, our yeah, theory, your, so, your theory, so it, it must be scientific. <laughs> well, you know, what you're talking about, I think most people in this group have um, heard about as structure. We talked about creating structure a lot when we did Pub 101, we talked about how regardless of what publishing platform you're using, you want to have consistent chapters and thinking about the reading experience um, that a student will have with that particular work and how important it is to think about their, their comprehension and the presentation of that material. So um, I'm gonna transition a little bit into sort of working relationships now that we have a bit of a background on publishing and who Scribe is and what you guys are doing. I'm going to dig a little deeper into like how exactly people work with you and what it means to be a back office services provider. 
So you mentioned some of your clients, some of the people who work with you, a lot of university presses. You know, why, why do university presses work with you at all? I think a lot of people think as the publisher name as someone who, or, or an entity that sort of does all the things. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, how university presses and how some of your clients divvy up that work and, and work with you? Right. So the answer to, you know, why they work with us and how they work with us is, is the why is a very simple thing. Uh, the, the, the why is that they can't do it themselves. And, and that they can't do it themselves runs the gamut of capacity. So for some publishers, they have full in-house staff that do edit, design, typeset, produce electronic books and on the average for their materials. And occasionally they'll get jammed in an area or they'll have some issues with deadlines or they'll have an individual project or an individual task that they just can't fit in at that moment. And so they'll come to us and they'll just basically say, hey, we need someone to proofread this or index this or copy edit this or typeset this book. Can you handle that? And yes, the answer to that is yes. Um, on the opposite side of that spectrum, there are a couple publishers for whom we work that are British or European based publishers for whom we are their entire publishing entity in the United States. Um, they may have a sales and marketing team. In, in both cases, they do have a sales and marketing team, but they have no editorial production design staff or support staff other than that. So we handle everything from the moment a book is acquired or in the case of the British publisher and the other European publisher, often they will have already published something and we either need to translate it or Americanize it. So it's taking a previously published book and making it suitable to the US market. And that means re-editing it, designing it, be typesetting it, all of those things. In the middle is more usually the situation. Um, publishers very often don't have the full staff to produce books. It, the, the majority of the publishers that we encounter don't have a large enough editorial staff to copy edit their books or to check the references or to make sure that permissions are handled or to proofread or index their books. So they'll come to us for those things. Or some of our clients do not have a typesetting department or a person who can typeset. So they come to us for that. And then very frequently, uh, publishers will use us for what's called full service or packaging. That is, you know, they'll have a, a, a book that they've acquired or they want to do, and they'll hire us to do the copy editing, the typesetting, the proofreading, the indexing, author management, etc. Some of those for the academic books will be peer reviewed. So sometimes we'll handle the review process for those. Some of them will require what's called developmental editing. And you mentioned structure. So theoretically, the books that are transmitted to us have already, most of them have already gone through what is called acquire acquisitions editor, editing or developmental editing. So they theoretically should be ready for copy editing. Very often though, when we get a book, it will notice that there's structural inconsistencies. And then one of the things that we like to pay attention to, the reason that structure is so important is that it gives consistency to the experience so that people can better comprehend it. For textbooks, this is particularly important because it structure is the way the relationship between things and the way we synthesize things requires structure and it requires a consistency because of the way we expect things when we're learning. We're trying to synthesize that to our already like existent base of knowledge. And so often one of the things that we'll do in addition to the services that I just mentioned is that we'll do a structural analysis of publications and make sure that they're not only consistent in terms of having the same elements from chapter to chapter for a textbook, but also that they have a, a good structural architecture to them as well. Thanks, David. 
good. I think hearing about the range of services that you guys will provide for publishers is really helpful and helps illuminate why the Open Textbook Network partnered with Scribe in offering access to some of those services because you know university presses are in a similar position to most library publishing organizations in that you don't have a, a deep bench of you know editorial staff you don't have copy editors and typesetters and um, proofreaders and people with that expertise um, of course the question is whether you have adequate funding um, <laughs> yes. to hire those people but you know I, there are some people um, who find themselves with you know grants sort of dropping into their laps or monies that need to be spent um, or you know a situation where you need to get publications out quickly and the idea of being able to hand over all of it or parts of it to a partner um, has some appeal and there's some necessity for that. So I think this is also a good time to point out that the OTN is, is the Scribe client here and it's through our relationship with Scribe that our members can access these services. So um, Sunny in Hawaii would not necessarily be able to call up Scribe and say, hey, I have this book, can you do these things? Um, unless she wanted to partner with Scribe and pay some of those um, fees involved with establishing oneself as a client. So David, could you talk just a small bit about that and sort of um, bring that to, to light? Yeah, so um, for our workflow, we, we offer, in addition to our services, so just to take a step back because a lot of a couple of the people didn't know what uh, well-formed document workflow was so because we moved upstream that is we started on the end and then worked our way to the beginning of the process which is a little bit different in structure from the normal way that a publishing services company would start we saw immediately how things connected electronically and we had an expertise in xml um, starting in the early 90s because of the programs and the research that we were doing. And so what happened was we developed a system which is now called the Wellformed Document Workflow System, which enables us to publish things efficiently and also to move things from one format, for example, from Word to InDesign ready files or from Word into EPUB or from InDesign into EPUB in a efficient and accessible manner. And so that well-formed document workflow, in addition to being the basis for all the work we do, it also is a software as service. So we have a number of university press and university library publishing programs that subscribe to our well-formed document workflow. They pay an annual fee. They have access to our technology. Some of them don't use us at all for actual service. Um, and that's how that works. Now, that, the access through the, the, to the well-formed document workflow is offered through the OTN. It's not directly to us. Um, and then we have an arrangement with how that works. If someone's developing a program outside of the OTN, of course, we're happy to have that conversation with you. If you're just hiring us for service, that particular aspect doesn't apply. But my understanding is they still, Karen, you'll have to clarify this. My understanding is that they still come through you and then get in touch with Elvis through Karen, correct? Yeah, we coordinate together. So, you know, the, the projects, um, they don't necessarily come through me, but like Sunny is working on a project right now. Sorry to keep using you as an example, Sunny, but, um, you know, she's working on a project right now. The author is, really motivated and has been working really hard to wrap things up and now Sunny and Elvis and Mike are talking about okay you know how can we start estimating what it will cost to do different things like perhaps copy edit or do the um, cover design different things like that so um, so it's through this relationship that we're able to sort of figure out how we're working together in the early days of the co-op, in the first two iterations, it was, joining the co-op was using the well-formed document workflow. Like those two things really were hand in hand. And this third iteration, which I think everyone here except Sunny, um, is sort of part of the third cohort, 
um, you joined through Pub 101 with a more open-ended, you know, how am I going to publish pathway with still having access to Scribe and the file forms that you have below. And so part of why we're here today and part of, you know, what I'll do when we wrap up today is feel out, you know, are there people in a position who want to learn the form document workflow? It's a, it's a, um, a little bit of a lift to learn um, this particular methodology. And it probably makes sense if you have a few books on the horizon. And it may make less sense if you're still filling out your program, you're not quite sure, or maybe there's just one book um, that you're working on to start. So um, speaking of heavy lifts, David, I know that you know a lot of um, programs are, are bootstrapped or they might um, be looking for really affordable ways to do this work. What do you think are some of the trade-offs between, for example, hiring a student who could gain professional experience or um, uh, working with a, a publishing services provider with you know, the obvious caveat that you have a, uh, invested interest in the answer. Well, I mean, obviously, there's a vested interest in the answer, although um, we spend a lot of time with our university press clients trying to cultivate their interns and their, uh, we call it work study labor. They have different names up for it occasionally. The, the reality is, is, is this. Uh, very rarely, I have never actually seen it. Can a person who is an undergraduate or even graduate level student copy it well? And it's not because they lack grammar or linguistic capacity, it's that they just don't have the experience to do that copy. And for certain kinds of books, like monographs or other kind of nonfiction books, sometimes that doesn't matter. But we feel it's really important to, especially on the editorial side, we feel it's really important to make sure that when you're editing a book, that you use a professional editor who is experienced in textbook development, who understands the nuances of the requirements, the complexity of the work at hand, and who also understands both pedagogy and reading comprehension. And so it doesn't have to be scribe. We spend an exorbitant amount of time developing those skills amongst our, you know, all of our staff are full time. We spend a lot of time attentive to that, but we're not the only ones who can do that. I, I would argue that the kinds of publishing that everyone on this call is doing, that you at least would want to have a professional copy of it. And I would also argue that like just hiring a freelancer or a professional copy editor doesn't necessarily get you what you need. You really need to be very attentive and, and, and careful about what that person is going to do and that that person is going to achieve what your goals are. So, you know, obviously we think Scribe does a great job. Sometimes we turn down projects because we just don't think we're well suited for them. But whether it's Scribe or not, I, I would I would encourage people to at least budget for professional copy. Sunny, I see that you have a related question, please. Yeah, so um, uh, as, as Karen was saying, um, my author just finished um, her final draft and um, we're, we're going to be, um, I'm going to be sending it in to Elvis and Mike and Karen, but um, this is my first time um, mm -hmm. for any of this. Um, so um, listening to your uh, description of copy editing and structural analysis, so if, if we, um, we definitely want to go through a copy editing session if we can afford it, and I think we can, but we'll figure that out. Um, when you were talking about the structural analysis um, and, and making suggestions about how to arrange the content so that it really captures the reader's um, uh, attention, um, what I'm hearing then is, is that included in the copy editing module of services? Or? 
So when we receive a manuscript, we vet it. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things, and, and so there's, there's actually two vets that we do. We do a vet for estimating the cost and time for a project. And then if you accept our estimate, then we do what we call copy over vet. So when we go through something initially, uh, when you're going through something, there are certain decisions and certain elements that you need to build into your procedure before you start copy editing. And, and it depends on the project, but in general, those are things like making sure that you're developing a style sheet. That is, you have a list of the names of people that are in there, the proper nouns. You've determined how you're going to handle certain um, terminology. Now, it, that may not be comprehensive. Our, our, we have a tool to do that and then we work through that. But so you want to have a style sheet developed so that, you know, I know that your name is spelled in a particular way that each time I encounter that, it's done correct. The second thing you want to do is you want to see, especially for textbooks, you want to see what kind of structural elements there are in a sort of general sense. Does this person have a uh, I don't know, uh, some kind of note system that he or she is doing. Does this person present learning goals? Is this person doing chapter summary? Um, does this person, you know, have further questions? Whatever it is for each each book, um, the word is slipping me. But you know, I, I, I just say, but the definitions of terms that they first appear. I can't think of the word right now. I'm sorry. We've called them structural elements in the past. No, no, no. I'm talking about like if I use a word in a, in a sentence and I make it bold, very often I will have a reference to that in the back of the oh, book. Glossary? Glossary. Thank you. I couldn't remember the name. But you know, are there glossary terms and is there a glossary here? If so, what are the rules? And so you're, you're doing that there. And the answer is that yes, because if you see that it's normative to have X elements in each chapter, you need to make sure that they're in every chapter. And so you would report that and you would say, hey, look, before we start working on this, we know this chapter 10 is missing its glossary terms and you know, these kinds of things. And so, yes, the answer to that question is that. Um, we also look to make sure that the author is structurally structuring things in a consistent fashion. So that, for example, in chapter one, if that person tends to use subheads in the writing, but in chapter four, they're missing, we would either suggest, depending on our opinion of it, we would either suggest that those subheads be added to chapter four, because you want them to be consistent and you want the structure of the information you presented, or maybe we drop it from chapter one, because they're unnecessary. But yeah, so the answer to your question is, in a general sense, those things would be done. In a more sort of specific sense, when if we encounter things while we're working that we think are not particularly germane, useful, uh, comprehend, easily comprehended, et cetera, that's part of the editorial process that we would point out to those things as well. You know, sometimes it's a turn of phrase, and sometimes it's like you've gone down a path here that doesn't seem to be pedagogically consistent with the remainder of what you're trying to present, or we don't see that this is important. So, um, uh, like the sense I'm getting, and please correct me, um, is that um, there'll be an initial look at the material and uh, a proposed cost, um, and then uh, once uh, we start working, then there'll be a, a deeper look at the material. Of, um, this is what we would suggest um, in terms of, uh, to make it structurally more consistent, you know, across the course, et cetera, um, which means that the author would have to respond by writing more material or taking, taking material out is, and so there's this interactive developing of the uh, content. Yeah, so usually by the time the author thinks he or she is finished and you've 
gone back and forth and everything else. That developmental editing part of it is already usually completed. If, a, if something comes to us and it's not completed, as soon as we started to vet the manuscript, we would be in contact with you and we would say, hey, this isn't ready for copy editing yet. Okay. We could assess, we could assess what the copy editing would entail at that point. But we would say, hey, wait a minute, before it's ready for copy editing, we suggest the following thing. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we think should be done up front that is not necessarily typical for copy editing. Um, the most time consuming, expensive part of editing these books are notes and bibliographies and reference components. And very often when we vet them, for example, and we see inconsistencies, one of the things we would come back to you and say is, hey, look, before we even start this, can we get the author to clean this up so that we don't have to be involved in this and it doesn't cost you money and time? The other thing is, is that if we edit something and then the notes, you know, we say, hey, look, the notes are incomplete here. And we send it back to the author for his or her review. And then she sends it back to us and theoretically has addressed the notes. Nine times out of 10, the job isn't sufficient. So we end up having to do a lot of extra work and we try to avoid that. And so from the copy editing standpoint, if, if it's ready for copy editing, then we'll come back to you with some structural issues that we've seen. Uh, here's a good example. So yesterday I got a book transmitted from the University Press and the person who acquired the book was the director of the press, which is unusual in this case. And the director thought that the book was ready for copy edit. And he said, hey, this book needs to be copy edited and it, but it doesn't even need a real copy edit because it's really well written. Maybe just all you need to do is like a light, light copy edit or a heavy proofing. And so we vet it. And immediately we saw that he was smoking crack, um, that he wasn't really paying attention to some of the issues that were involved in it because he was so deeply involved, he wasn't actually seeing those issues any longer. But there were a lot of comma splice issues, there were a lot of issues with the notes, there was missing information, there was incomplete sentences, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if we were gonna copy any of that, we would have start, we would have said, okay, we have to do all this work. Instead, what we said is, wait, before we even attack this, let's solve some of these issues. First of all, your notes and bibliographies are not complete. Second of all, there are certain sentences that just wander off that aren't really fully completed. Can we send this back to the author? And of course, he said, absolutely. We got in touch with the author. The author is now working on this thing. And when it comes back to us, it's copy edited, at least. 80% of those things will be addressed, if that makes sense. And that's what we kind of try to do from a pre copy edit standpoint. Okay. Now, um, th there's um, the, um, there's these, the IPDs, these um, the, um, uh, integrated pedagogical devices or instructional pedagogical devices that are placed in certain areas like a vocabulary word moment or a tip or have you thought of those kinds of elements um, and um, they have not been developed for these chapters and I've been uh, you know we we've, we've been talking about a sense of the pattern that we want to establish for the chapters and right. which IPD she wants to use um, but um, they're not in the content right now that I'll be sending that I was planning to send to scribe to take a look at to get some kind of an estimate as to what the work is going to be. Um, is it um, too soon or is it better that we send it to you the way it is and then get the feedback, um, get the feedback from you and then? Well, e either way, but if you have pedagogical elements that you plan on integrating into the content, you'd want that the whole thing to be edited all at once. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't want to do it piecemeal. And mm -hmm. you would want to make sure that they were there. I mean, because when, when you're analyzing these things, you're doing two things. You're asking the question of, are they grammatically correct? And, but then more important, you're asking, are these germane to the section in which they are put, mm -hmm. right? Because if you're, if you're asking the question, 
and it assumes, it, let's say you're in chapter five and you're asking a question in that activity or that summary or whatever it is that you're asking, assumes an understanding of something that doesn't show up until chapter six, which is not uncommon, by the way. Mm -hmm. Then what happens is, is that, you know, someone would actually point that out and say, well, wait a minute, this is dependent on this body of information, which isn't presented until later. What do you want to do about that? And so I would encourage you in that case, if you're trying to get budgets, you can send something to us and we're happy to give us our, give you our quick analysis of it and say, here's, you know, on a maximum price situation, so long as the author doesn't make radical changes to the content, this is what you can expect to spend on this for this work. Mm -hmm. But, but we would suggest that you bring it to its full completion and ready for copyright. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. Within my context, I'm working with the fiscal year. Ah, so uh, yes. That's always problematic because, um, you know, in 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 this world, everything is supposed to be done within 12 months. <laughs> when? And, and they don't give you the money until, you know, so late that you only have nine months. <laughs> when? When? When does your fiscal year end? June 30th. So, oh, yeah. Um. So that's kind of the environment I'm working with. There, there is a little flex um, because there, in in my particular, in our particular negotiations with our funder, you know, they'll go, well, you know, if if you if you plan this, then we'll let you keep the money to the next fiscal year. But that's always a case by case discussion. Right, and and in our world, the so we like to separate out the money from the process. Yeah. You know, we're very process focused and then people like me or there's a couple other people in the company who are concerned about the financials. But at the end of the day, the reality is, is that, you know, we work with a lot of institutional publishers and many of them have fiscal years that don't necessarily correspond to their publishing right. schedules, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's usually just if there are creative ways to work around. Mm -hmm. And we're happy to happy to have that conversation. Like, hey, you know, here's where we are, and we understand your fiscal year. So, delaying in many cases, or you know, early estimations of costs, etc. We're happy to to accommodate that issue. So I'm just going to interject because um, we have about a quarter of an hour left, and I think it's really helpful to listen in, Sunny. So you for sharing your your case study and where you are. I think it's helpful to listen in um, to your conversation with David and hear about the back and forth that's involved and see like okay this is the process or you know this need you know we want to try and have everything finished before you move into copy editing. That's really kind of a, a first stage of the end stage so to speak. Um, but I did say that I would leave time for other questions. And we also haven't talked all that much about the well-formed document workflow, although it's what David wanted to just start right in with. <laughs> so, um, so since, you know, part of why we're having this conversation is to feel out, you know, is this a good time for people to learn the well-formed document workflow? Um, I'm gonna sort of let that question hang while I open it up and see if any of you who are here would like to ask David something so that we're not crunched and you're asking it two minutes before we're adjourning. Feel free to unmute. Maybe you have your own case study or your own question about how things work. Well, my question is kind of related to the well-formed document workflow, so maybe we'll get to that, but I'm curious you know, we talked about it as something that you learn and we talked about it as a process and then it's also something that you can pay for as a service. Um, I'm curious, what are the steps that we should take in order to evaluate whether this is something we want to pursue? Is it, is it, can we take a test drive or how does that work? Yeah, it's a great question, Amanda. I can send you, um, you know, uh, a representative video from past training so you can kind of get a taste of here's what's involved in the training and then the other litmus test that we've 
thought of um, is just whether you have multiple projects and what and if so then it might be worth investing the time in training somebody who hopefully is you know a consistent person there might, maybe there's a student who could learn this and just kind of whip it out um, but I think it's you know it's like anything you know we have a first-hand experience with learning you learn it but then you really learn it when you do it and then you get your groove you know going once you've done it a few times and you know I really think that the well-formed document workflow falls in sort of that category of things um, so I'll, I'll send out a video as a follow-up and then David is there anything you would add um, for Amanda's evaluation no I would just augment your statement we kind of we, we, we you use the rule of three with respect to scribe training and projects. So we train you the first time, you know, it's a bit of a struggle. The second time you think you've got it, but then maybe you do something incorrectly or, you know, don't quite understand something. And then it's usually by the third project that people really get the hang of it. And so it's really set up predominantly for people who have programs, publishing programs. Now, everything we do, we do within the Wellform Doctrine while we offer it as a software as service, its main purpose is to facilitate the services that Scribe offers. And it's, it originally was a completely homegrown tool that we use to enable Scribe to remain competitive against offshore offerings. And so the reason why the OTN wanted to offer well-formed document workflow training was knowing that you could offset costs potentially by learning how to do it in-house. And so if there's someone who's structuring the documents, then you would save some expense before handing it over to Scribe to do some of their services um, rather than paying them to do it, which of course is another option. So that we wanted to kind of experiment with that flexibility or see you know, if that, it, that investment of time and human resource um, would be worth it for doing this particular workflow. Now I'm going to try and um, describe the Wellform Document Workflow, or WFDW for short, um, from, from my point of view as the person who doesn't run the business. Um, and then David can um, chime in. But to summarize, the Wellform Document Workflow is a way of identifying different parts of a text that always serve the same purpose. So we've talked about structure, we talked about this idea of integrated pedagogical devices, saying that you know um, every chapter is always going to start with bullet points about the main topics covered. So if you have learned the well-formed document workflow, you would go, you would decide, okay, these bullet points are always going to be treated this particular way at the start of the chapter. Now I'm going to look through this document for all of the places where that happens, and I'm basically going to mark it or I'm going to tag it using what's called the scribe add-in tool. And so you add this tool to Word, and then you look for the things and you mark them. And so every chapter then, uh, as you go through the manuscript, will have, if, if you have a consistent textbook, will have sort of the same elements throughout that you have tagged using that scribe, scribe add-in tool. That's how I would describe sort of learning the well-formed document workflow, um, which sounds, Perhaps simpler than, than it is, Sunny, would you add anything as someone who went through the training? No, no, that's an, that's an excellent description. Um, it feels like the training was five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, hence all my questions. <laughs> right. But, yeah, but that is, that's a good summary. Um, the, uh, I really, that was to me, um, part of the training that I really liked was that part about how to structure. And, and now I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I didn't do any of that. <laughs> so, um, um, I, you know, uh, I should have probably worked more closely with the author, but we didn't have the content until yesterday. Yeah, so I think I'll be that really another look at it. Yeah. That points out the reality and the challenge, back to David's comment, of learning something new, especially sort of in a publishing timeline where it's like, well, at what point should I learn the well-formed document workflow? Should I learn it when I have a project in hand or do I need a preview? And then when I get the project, you know, I'll be able to implement it. And there, there isn't really a sweet spot, I think, in real life uh, with, with the perfect time to learn the workflow. 
um, with the caveat that if you're if you have a program going, you know, yeah. trying to get a program going with multiple publications, then that could be a good thing. Right. And then just knowing that the first time you learn it, it's going to be a little rocky. The second time as you start to implement it, there's that same back and forth. You know, I saw it with Karen Bjork. I've seen it with other teams. Hey, we took a shot at structuring this. How does it look? Mm -hmm. um, and sending in, you know, a sample chapter and sending something in. And, you know, Elvis um, is just wonderful to work with. And he'll send it right back and say, you know, all these things look good. But, hey, you know, we probably would have done it this way for these mm -hmm. other two things. So there's still that learning process. It's not like we'll do a training and then you're on your own and good luck. Um, there's a training and then there's still kind of that um, getting to know the workflow experience and then um, hopefully kind of a, things start coming after. Right. And, and I guess the, the, there's the whole concept of the composing, uh, the, the composing stage, which I thought I was going to be more involved with. Mm -hmm. So the composing stage is what we call the, the sort of tagging, if you will. That's, that's also called composition just for... Right. And and then that's that's where it's before that process and during that process where where all the structures get worked out. I would think, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I think, but it's also you know a conversation with the author. You know, what elements of textbooks uh, do you like? Do you think work well for your students? Do you think would work well for this material? You could sit down. You know, we have a list in in our Canvas course of we have a list of common elements. That could be a good starting point. Okay, like here's a list of common elements. You know, which four or five of these do you think um, you would like to integrate into your chapters, knowing that each chapter would have the same particular elements? Which which we've done, and she's settled on about four kinds of um, IPDs that she would like to use. It's just that we um, she hasn't developed them yet. Mm -hmm. so. Amanda, I see your question in the chat. There is not an additional charge to use the workflow. We cover the charge of training um, for, the, for our members, and then um, you would actually be able to probably reduce um, any charges that Scribe had for their services if you um, structured or composed, as, as Sunny said, if you composed the documents. Could I just add two quick things? Mm -hmm. Number one is, so what you're calling comp composing or structuring, um, just so everyone understands, that is essentially what we've done is we've mapped a rich XML standard to styles in both Word and InDesign. So when you're working with the InDesign, actually what you're doing is you're applying styles. And our SAI is just the scribe add in is just a way to facilitate that. Um, and hopefully they're named in ways that are intuitive. We use the Chicago Manual of Style. I just put that behind me, so now you can see. There it is. We use the Chicago Manual of Style nomenclature in our systems. And by the way, the reason that's there is because the, the CMS is built on our well-formed document workflow. Um, but I, I'll, I, I mentioned that not as a plug for Scribe, but to explain the second thing that I wanted to mention, which is mostly directed to Amanda. So in addition to numbers of titles, one of the criteria that we suggest is also if you're doing, if you have either a multi-purpose, that is you're producing both for both print and electronic, and you have an accessibility desire or requirement, then it kind of justifies the learning curve because everything that comes out of our system is by definition accessible. Um, and then a little thing to add. so. With respect to the authors, we have something, if you go up onto our website, Karen, I don't know if it's up in Canvas, but you're welcome to do that. The SAI Light Sale. It's a template and environment, and it uses described styles, but the tools are very, they're simplified and they're very straightforward. And a number of our clients, most prominently the University of Michigan and the Michigan Publishing Services, what they're doing is they're asking their author to submit their documents using the SAI Lite. And they get, we call it a B. We're happy to get B level work out of them with respect to that. We get about an 80 to 85% compliance, but that's way better than zero. And there, instead of having to learn the codes or the nomenclature, 
the buttons that apply styles have their names on them, like chapter number, chapter title, A head, et cetera. And so, so it's much more intuitive. It's much less robust, but it is an easy way for you to get your author's entry into a structured environment. Thanks, David. I'm really glad you brought up accessibility too, because I think that's one of the advantages of working with you is having the confidence to know that the documents are accessible and, and meet those standards. So I put a link in the chat to Scribe Lite. Um, and I, I also put a link in the chat um, to the forum that I uh, mentioned at the beginning of our call, which is just basically asking do you think that now is the time for you and your organization to learn the Wellform document workflow? Um, there's also other questions in that form about related publishing topics that you might want to learn. So even if you're not sure about the Wellform document workflow or don't know yet, um, I encourage you to fill out this form. I'll send a link um, via email too, because it will help determine you know, what other topics you would like to learn about and what kind of things you'd like to cover. So we have just a couple minutes remaining. Are there any other questions of David about WFDW, accessibility, composing, structure, all these, all these words? I just have a quick follow-up question. So what is the, the outcome of a document that's created using the well-formed document workflow? Is it the final fully published thing or is it a manuscript that is ready to be copy edited and perfected or something else. David, you're muted. Sorry, I forgot to unmute. The answer is yes. Um, so we refer to our system as XML first, XML always. And so it just depends on what you're trying to achieve. Um, so the, the end output is what you wish. Right, so that could be a typeset document, it could be PDF, it could be, we just released a new set of tools for our system to do what is often called a, a linked or web PDF automatically, um, or an ebook or both. It's, our, our system is fully functional as soon as a word file or a text file is composed, that is the structure is applied using our styles. From that point on, it's the working document is whatever you happen to be working in and whatever the final need is. You know, some of our clients are not publishing for print, they're just doing electronic or XML-based publishing and then the materials just get converted into whatever their XML standard is, usually like DocBook or TEI or something like that. So I didn't answer your question. Well, it. <laughs> it might be helpful, David, if you could just um, list the file types that can be produced in the hub. And then also, I'll just take this opportunity to, to remind everyone that since Scribe is not a publisher, you would need an institutional repository or some place to put the files. Um, you wouldn't be pointing people to the Scribe website. You would, you would be keeping those files yourself. And one of the nice things is that you can make that Word file available. So it's, you know, a more editable file, but there's also a host of other file types, which include, David. Okay, so, um, so it includes Word files, and we do what we call uh, round-tripping Word. I'll explain that at the end of this. Uh, ready for InDesign files, InDesign XML output, Scribe markup output, EPUB 2, 3, as well as Mobi files, HTML output, HTML5 or XHTML, as well as then round tripping so that if you go through the editorial and production process, at any point you can also output that and generate a new Word file that had all of your alterations and updates and changes to it so that you could come back and re edit that book for a second or third or fourth edition. That about covers it. Yeah, thanks David. And Sunny, I see your question is typing only for print versions and yes. The answer is yes. 
All right. Well, we're at the hour and I know people have additional meetings. So thank you, David. And thanks for everyone for coming and listening and bringing your questions. I will um, follow up with an email, but uh, please do fill out the form to uh, let me know what kind of future training would be helpful to you and your organization. So thanks everyone. Hope you have a good week. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all very much for your time and either Elvis or I are always available. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Karen, for organizing. <laughs>